Thank you for coming by for my midweek Bible study. It is March the 6th, Wednesday, and I call this Bible study Building the Church. It's from 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 through 17. Important passages of Scripture and stuff we really need to understand. Now, on Mondays and Fridays, I put out sermons and uh, the Bible study in the middle of the week on Wednesday. And other times I put out shorter messages. And then every day I do six short Bible thoughts. And every day I do my uh, devotional Bible reading and prayer with you. And if you put a prayer request in the, in the uh, comments, I'll pick up on it and put out a prayer video and get hundreds of people praying for you. So be a part of, my, of this. I call it Christian Ministry Central. It's about touching people for Christ to make a difference in people's lives. Christian Ministry Central. And I teach the Bible. I'm a pastor. Been doing this for 50 years or more. Been studying the Bible for 52. And uh, be a part of it, okay? It'll, it'll build your life. And share it with other people. Let's pray. Father, speak to us through 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 17. Change our lives by what we hear. Change our church by what we hear. And make a difference, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If I, if I asked a question to... To the average guy walking down the street, and uh, and and this question was was this: What do you think this, the guy would say? Just an average dude walking down the street, you know. And I said, "What does it take to build the church?" What do you think they'd say to that question? Good question. Most people would say, "Well, it would maybe it would take a contractor or building funds or a bank loan or." money from whatever source, building materials. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say about building the church? We are going to understand that. We're going to redefine the church for a lot of people, and it needs to be redefined. Um, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 4. Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food. For you were not, re not yet ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. You're still worldly. For since there's jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, Apollos, are you not mere men? Notice he's not talking about buildings. <laughs> he's talking about the church, which is people. And the first thing that needs to be understood is that worldliness will not work. Worldliness won't work. The Christians in Corinth are worldly. He says they're mere infants in Christ. Why does he say that? Well, they were worldly, not spiritual. Okay, that was their problem. They were worldly, not spiritual. So he fed them milk, the basics, you know, not solid food. Why? Because they're infants spiritually. Why are they worldly and why are were they infantile? He makes it very clear. It's because of jealousy and quarreling over personalities, okay? This goes on today. Jealousy and quarreling over personalities. Some people said, well, I follow the teachings of Paul. Others, I follow the teachings of Apollos. Apollos was a well-known preacher. He shows up in the book of Acts. You know, Paul helped him in the book of Acts. Went to Corinth, was involved in ministry there. So people were acting like mere men, worldly as opposed to spiritual. So they got involved in jealousy and quarreling. Um, said, verse 3, you are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? Yeah, they were. They were fussing about the personalities, the, te the personalities of the teachers that they followed. And he says, you're acting like mere men, worldly as opposed to spiritual. Spiritual would assume that you're doing things godly, you know, in a godly way. Does jealousy and quarreling over personalities go on today? Well, I would hope to shout it does. Fussing about personalities, the Bible teachers, different things happens all the time today. You know, I get comments in my, on my YouTube channel when I teach something. Things like, check out Pastor So-and-so. He really knows what's going on. 
Uh, stuff like that happens all the time. Pastor so-and-so, whomever he might be. You ought to check out this guy's teaching and that guy's teaching. No. You know what? What teaching should we get? The Bible. <laughs> the biblical text. The text of the Bible. Worldliness is alive and well. And people are fussing about all kinds of doctrinal things. All kinds of um, who is the best teacher which is irrelevant. Uh, the best teacher is Jesus. Always has been. Always will be. Now look at verses 5 through 9 of that third chapter of 1 Corinthians. What after all are what after all is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes it grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose. This is so important, okay? And each will be rewarded according to his own labor. He labors for one purpose, is the point. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. We're going to redefine the church here. Not a building, it's people, okay? So how should personalities be viewed, okay? So what are Paul and Apollos? He answers that. Paul's careful, and he's really careful in the way he says this. He says, he, doesn't, he does not say we are servants. Instead, he says, only servants through whom you came to believe. The focus is off of personality. It's not we, Okay, he doesn't say that. And the focus is off of the personalities and it's all on being servants. You know, uh, only servants through whom you came to believe. We are no more than servants. It's not about my personality. It's about being a servant of Christ and teaching or preaching his word. That's what it's about. Paul planted, Apollos watered. Okay, they all had their function. They all had their job to do. They all had their role. But God made what the servants planted and watered grow. They served. They planted. They taught. They led people to the Lord. They watered what they plot, planted. They tried to teach and bring people to Christ. But God made it grow. That's the thing. They set the stage for God to move by serving God, making a difference in people's lives. The servants are not anything. He's clear about this. But God is everything because he makes it grow. He takes the efforts of planting the seed of the good news about Jesus and makes it grow. So what does the servant plant and what does he water? Look at verse 5 again. What after all is Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord assigned to each task. The, the thing you want to plant is the, the good news about Jesus so people will believe. Belief, faith is the thing that you want to plant. God grows what servants plant and water, and that's belief in Christ, trust in Christ. It's the word for faith all over again. The servants have one purpose, one purpose, and that is to see faith grow in more and more people, for more and more people to be affected and affected by the faith. So that's what they teach, that's what they preach, and God makes it grow. They plant, they water, so God can make things happen. And you know what, I, I look at churches today, not a lot of that going on today. A lot of folks are just having church. That's not what's supposed to happen. You're supposed to be impacting more and more people with the truth of God's word. You plant, somebody waters, you plant, you water, you plant, you water, and, and God makes it grow. More people come to Christ. More people grow in Christ. Workers like Paul and Apollos are rewarded by the Lord. They're honored in heaven, okay? They're racking up spiritual, it doesn't get them into heaven, but they're racking up spiritual brownie points to be recognized and rewarded when they get to heaven. We don't know what those rewards are like, but you know what? If it's from God, it'll be bueno. It'll be really, really good. Look at verse 9 again. 
I'll get my glasses to work. <laughs> For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. building. They're servants. They're workers who work the field and who work at building the building. They're construction professionals, spiritual construction professional, spiritual professional farmers who work the field and spiritual professional builders who build the church, the, the building of the church. It's not And it's not a physical building. It's the people of God. So what is God feel, God's field and building? He calls, he refers to it as you. He's not talking to the building. He's talking to the people, the folks, the, the gathered people of God, the church. That's who he's talking to, okay? So the thing built is God's people, the assembled people of God. It's, it's called the church, and it's not a place, it's a people, okay? Ministry of the gospel leading people to faith builds the people of God as people serve God and grow more, more see more people grow in Christ and come to Christ, come to Christ and grow in Christ. What, in fact, I've heard people, what is the important thing about the gospel? Is it the people, more people come to Christ or is it people grow in Christ? And people will think, think it has to be one or the other. Nonsense. It's not just about growing, an individual growing in Christ. And it's not just about more people growing in Christ, Got more people coming to Christ. It's about both. More people come to Christ and those people who come to Christ grow more in Christ. More people come to Christ, and they all grow more in Christ. That's what it's about. It's about numerical growth and spiritual growth, both. You don't trade one off. That's the problem. That doesn't, They both don't happen. But if if you plant and water, guess what? will happen. It will happen. Look at verses 10 through 15. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else and someone else is building on it but each one should be careful how he builds for no one can lay up any foundation other than the one already laid which is Jesus Christ if any man builds on this foundation using silver gold costly sil uh, using gold silver costly stones wood hay or straw his work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will be he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. The um, the foundation must be perfect. The foundation must be perfect. Um, you know, I, in 1986, I was pastoring a church in Lemon Grove, California, the Christian Church of Lemon Grove. We built education buildings and a parking lot and some other stuff in those in that started in 86 and ended in 87. The slab of the major building we were built building was one of the elders and I were looking at it. It was in there crooked. It was cockeyed. The found and it had to be changed and it was very expensive for the construction people to change it. They had to cut some off and pour some other parts of the slab. It was a slab and it was off. Listen, the foundation of God's people is, is like that building. It has to be perfect. So what is the foundation of the people of God? What are we talking about? Okay. Paul laid the foundation and then others built on the foundation. Paul laid the foundation as a as an expert builder. So what's the foundation? Look at verse 11. Again. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, is the foundation. He's the only foundation. Okay, the, the, the only foundation is Jesus Christ. It's, it's not good feelings, okay? It's not even great worship, not even great teaching and preaching. It's Jesus, Jesus and him alone. I think you probably ought to have some good worship, but I think you probably ought to have some great teaching. But the foundation is the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians 1, 8, 118. 
over a page or so. 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The foolishness of the cross. The foolishness of the cross is nonsense to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. It's all about Jesus and the cross and what he paid at the cross. That's what builds the church. It's that teaching. The message of the cross and what Jesus paid for us there is the power of God for those who are being saved. That's the foundation. Listen, it'll always go back to the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ and the message of the cross. And that is what builds churches. Jesus and the message of the cross, that builds the church. It's not a bunch of slick um, methodologies that are worldly. It's not a great, great speaking. It's the message of the cross, the simplicity of the message of the cross, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, and the person of Christ as the Messiah, the only avenue back to a relationship with God. Look at verses 12 through 15 again. If any man builds this, builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw. His work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring to light. The day, the day will bring to light. That's the day that Jesus comes back. That's the day it'll bring, bring it to light. It'll be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. Okay, the uh, what's wrong with built with what's wrong with the building material he's talking about? It's man, it's man's stuff. That's not what the that's not what the kingdom is about. That's not what the temple of God is about. Matthew 24, 1 and 2, Jesus was talking about that, you know, they were tripping out on the temple, okay? And in Matthew 24, 1 and 2, Jesus left the temple and was walking away with his disciples when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to the buildings. Do you see all these things, he asked. I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. They tripped out on the temple. It took them, 40, I think, 45 years to build it. And the temple was the center of spiritual life, okay? But it's a shadow of the reality that's to come in Christ. Just a shadow. It's not the real thing. It's a shadow. We're going to redefine the real thing. What about buildings and temples? They won't last. That temple didn't. You know what happened in AD 70? Every stone on that temple was thrown down exactly like Jesus said. It was utterly destroyed, and a million Jews were killed when the Roman general Titus came and overran Jerusalem. Buildings are not what the, are not what the church is about, okay? Physical elements aren't what the church is built on. People are the church. People, and, and, and people who have been taught the gospel and Jesus, that's the church. Okay, and it's people who've been infected and affected by the truth of Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and who've been transformed because they've repented. They've been converted to Christ and Jesus rules their life. That's, that's what the church is about. Look at Matthew 16, 13 through 18. This is such an important passage of scripture. While Jesus came to the, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. What about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's known as the good confession. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my, by my Father in heaven. In other words, you got it. God revealed that to you. That's the truth, okay? And I tell you that you are Peter. He changed his name to Peter, okay, from Cephas. And 
it, Peter is, is Greek for rock, okay? And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell, at the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Peter, he didn't build his church on, G, on Peter. Some people say that, okay? He built his church on the rock, which is what Peter just confessed. The fact that 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 he is the Christ, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the Living God. He built the church. It's first of all, it's Jesus' church, and he builds it on the truth that he is the Christ, the Son of the Living God. He builds the church on him because it's his, and he's the one who died to pay for the church. He was nailed to a cross for the church. He was raised from the dead for the church. Church means assembly, the assembled people of God. Okay. It's his church, and he's the one who built it. Church, the church is built on the rock, the confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Ultimately, it's built on Jesus, okay? Physical stuff that we tend to call churches and that the old-time Jews called the temple, that all that physical stuff gets burned up at the day of the Lord. That's why he talks about the day, okay? It all gets fried at the day of the Lord. It all gets burned up. The guy building on the wrong stuff can be saved, he says, but just as though he escaped from the flames, okay? You've got to build on the right stuff. And I've known people who uh, were so focused on church buildings and stuff that they missed the church and they never got around to building the church, which is the people of God. There's a huge lesson there. Now let's re define the real temple, okay? The real temple verses 16 through 17 of the third chapter of 1 Corinthians. Do you not know, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is sacred and you are that temple. You know, this is the real temple, okay? Temple, the temple is God's people made holy because the Holy Spirit took up residence inside of them. They become the temple where the presence of God is, okay? The presence of God lives in them. And he, he says it this way. He says, you yourselves are the temple of God. Why, why are we the temple of God? Because the Spirit lives in us. And he's very emphatic. You are the temple. You yourselves he emphasizes that by almost stating it twice. You yourselves are the temple of God. You you Christian folks, you're the temple. It's not a building. If you destroy God's temple, that's God's people, his church. He says, listen to this, God will destroy you. Why would God destroy the person who wrecks his temple? Because the temple, the church, is sacred. It's sacred. God dwells in his people. It's holy to the Lord. It's not just a bunch of folks. It's a holy temple to the Lord because the Holy Spirit lives in the people of God. So how do people destroy the temple? How do people destroy God's temple today? You know what? They were doing it in Corinth. That was Paul's, Paul's problem with them. 1 Corinthians 3, 3 through 4, again, which we read earlier. You are still worldly, for since you, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, Apollos, are you not mere men? Listen, they were fussing, feuding, and fighting, and over personalities. They're arguing about personalities. People do that in churches all the time. And there, you know what? There's not good things in store for those who wreck churches. It's not. When you get involved in fussing about personalities and blow up churches, which happens all the time, you're destroying the people of God. And God says he'll destroy the person who does that. I was thinking about, um, I spent 12 years as pastor of the Christian Church of Lemon Grove. And in February of 1992, I think it was February of 92, I resigned to come to Porterville. And I had some people come to me and say, why don't you just stay here and, and we'll go out with you and we'll start a new church. We'll pull off from this church and start a new church. You know what I said? No way. No way. I won't do that. And then I told them this. I said, you stay here and you support the new pastor. They'll come up with a new pastor. And they did. You stay here and you fight for him. You know, S support his ministry, you know. 
And <clears throat> that new guy came in. His name was Myron. And uh, Myron Wells, I know him. He's a great guy, okay? And they, those people stayed and they supported him and worked with him. He spent 11 years there. I spent 12 years there. He spent 11 and God moved and added almost a thousand people to that church. Now I was there 12 years with God adding, I think I 778 people came in by <clears throat> transfer of membership or being baptized. About half of them were converted to Christ and it was the same for him. He had a, he had a better ministry than I did. But what if I destroyed that thing? It would have been harder for him to do that. God used him. God used us both. I planted, Myron watered. Myron planted, I watered, you know, the next guy watered. That's what it's about. It's not about fussing over personalities. Tom and Myron, servants who proclaimed Christ and Jesus built the church, which is the people of God. That's what's supposed to happen. That is what's supposed to happen. Hang on to that. Let's pray. Father, I cry out to you for your church. Uh, all around the world, all around the country, especially in America, it's floundering because people aren't building it, God. I pray that folks would get back to building the, ch the people of God, the church, back to proclaiming the good news of Jesus, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, planting, watering, and then I know you will grow it, Father. It's your job. We need to do ours and let you do yours. I praise you for the victory in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.